Our uh, second and final speaker for the night is uh, Kira Antinuk, who is a registered nurse. Uh, she will be presenting a feminist nursing critique of circumcision focusing on investigating the intersection between feminism and male genital integrity. Hi, everyone. Thanks for your patience while we worked through some technical issues. It wouldn't be a typical presentation night without some tech problems, so thanks for bearing with us. So I'm Kira, um, I'm a registered nurse, and I work for the federal government um, in Victoria, where I also am studying in the Masters of Nursing program at UBIC. I'm really excited to be here with all of you tonight. Um, and we have um, a slideshow that it's a little smaller than what I had hoped, but um, I hope that everyone can see. <coughs> So we'll just get right into it because we're coming to the end of our evening and I don't want to keep you all up too late. So I first learned about circumcision in 2003. I was 22 years old at the time and had no idea what male circumcision was. None. Now that may seem odd to you. By rights, as a Caucasian woman who grew up in North America, circumcision should likely have been something I took for granted as it still is for many people here. But my story is different. So in my mind, the intact penis was normal and how I imagined that all other penises looked. So all of this led to my complete bafflement when my husband and I found out we were expecting a baby boy during a prenatal appointment and were immediately asked by our physician if we would like to circumcise him. So what followed that was a profoundly life-altering journey in which I came to understand what circumcision is and realized that I had a responsibility as a mother, as a woman, and as a human being to protect all children from unnecessary genital cutting. I left my career as a graphic designer and became a nurse with the goal of being more effective in my research and in my work to educate. I've experienced incredible joys, like the countless times I've helped parents to learn and access information that protects their children from unnecessary genital cutting. But I've also experienced crushing sadness, like the time when a close family member cut their newborn baby so that he would match his father. Tonight, though, I feel delight and gratitude to be here with all of you. Let me switch here. So author Suzanne Arms spoke about the challenges involved in talking about male genital cutting and we had a little bit of discussion about that in the Q&A. Suzanne Arms says that the issue is wrapped up in shame and secrecy. I think that rational discourse is often impossible and people who speak out against male genital cutting are even mocked or vilified. Men who have been harmed are rarely heard and may not feel safe to talk about their feelings and experiences. Some of you here may have been impacted deeply by genital cutting and others of you may still be in the learning stages about the issue. Things you've heard or seen or experienced may be distressing to you. And it's possible that those emotions might be present right now. So I'd like to encourage each of you to feel safe and welcome to respond however you might need during our time together. We'll have a little bit of time together at the end to talk. And as I mentioned, Chris and I do have names of some therapists. If anyone should feel the need, please speak to us after, OK? So just jump back here. Boom. <laughs> so, feminism, at its best, encourages me to think broadly and critically about the potentially harmful effects of gender constructions on all people. To me, feminism should be more than a narrow interest group of women who care only about women's issues or women's rights. My feminism is bigger than that. I believe that feminism can help us to identify and challenge discourses and practices that engender all of us. In the year 2000, Canadian ethicist Margaret Somerville wrote about encountering an angry reaction from feminists when she spoke out against male infant circumcision. 
these feminists believed that her position detracted from the horror of female genital cutting and weakened the case against it by placing it in the same context as male infant circumcision. Now, Margaret wasn't alone in her experience. When instructor Kirsten Bell encouraged students taking a gender course in the United States to draw comparisons between male infant circumcision and female genital cutting, she recalled that the reaction of the students was both immediate and hostile. How dare I compare the innocuous and beneficial removal of the foreskin with the extreme mutilations enacted against female bodies in other societies? Still, further accounts of these attitudes can be found. For example, on the popular blog, Barrel of Oranges, the author writes, every time I suggest that child circumcision is a result and a part of patriarchy and the gender hierarchy, I'm practically martyred for saying such things. How dare I suggest that cutting the genitals of children is a feminist issue? How dare I suggest that feminists should be championing and working to end child genital cutting in the Western world? We all know that male circumcision is a medical procedure with health benefits, not like that heinous, awful female genital mutilation done to those poor girls in other countries by their awful, horrible Islamic parents. How dare I suggest that male circumcision and female genital mutilation are even comparable? Upon review in 2009, scholars Marie Fox and Michael Thompson found that most feminist considerations of female genital cutting either omit cons to consider male genital cutting altogether or deem it a matter of little ethical or legal concern. Why might this be? This is tricky. So biomedical ethicist Dina Davis observed that the very use of the term circumcision carries vaguely medical connotations, serves to normalize the practice of male genital cutting. Conversely, it's worth noting, and I'll show you right here on the screen in a second. Gosh, this is tricky. There we go. It's worth noting how the term female circumcision was essentially erased from academic legal and to some extent popular discourse following the World Health Organization's redesignation of the practice as FGM or female genital mutilation in 1990. The WHO's justification was that the new terminology carried stronger moral weight. So terminology then as well as the differential constructions of the practices themselves seems to protect male genital cutting from the critical scrutiny that other practices like female genital cutting attract. Now it seems pretty clear to me that this asymmetry extends to the very different understandings of genitalia and human tissue that we all have. Here in the West, for example, we're heavily invested in the clitoris to the extent that its excision results in what Canadian anthropologist Janice Bodie referred to as serious personal diminishment. I found this online a few days ago and I wanted to include it. Janice Bodie went on to say, we customarily amputate babies' foreskins now with some controversy, but little alarm. Yet global censure of these practices is scarcely comparable to that leveled at female circumcision. Is it because these excisions are performed on boys and only girls and women figure as victims in our cultural lexicon? I thought that was really interesting. So Chris has talked about how male infant circumcision has been justified and promoted over the years in medicine. Medical historian David Gallagher explained, so it happened that the foreskin, despised by the medical profession, came to broadly signify ignorance, neglect, and poverty. Let's go back over here. Mm -hmm. Researchers Thompson and Fox wrote that the foreskin was feminized in these pro-circumcision discourses that relied on and played into the myths of female disease, contagion, and uncleanliness. 
these accounts, the foreskin is either analogized to the clitoris or labia, or is more generally characterized as a permeable and dangerous interior space. These depictions connect to broader understandings of the foreskin as feminized flesh or an inner sensitized world that's incompatible with the aesthetic of masculine embodiment. Unfortunately, similar associations continue in spite of our contemporary awareness about the prepuce as a complex tissue. So in a recent medical journal, the foreskin is characterized as, and I quote, a piece of prehistoric human culture that now only exists as a reservoir of infection. That's a medical textbook from the year 2000. I can understand why many people resist the comparison between female and male genital cutting. I've mentioned how terminology influences us. But when we look at the ways in which male and female genital cutting are portrayed in the media, and Chris has talked about this a little bit, female genital cutting is typically pre presented in its most severe form, while male genital cutting is conversely depicted as a minor medical procedure. I've got a little example here to show you about that. Let's just go down here. There we go. Some of you might recognize the uh, image from the bottom. It's a local one. So Chris talked about what the media doesn't tell us, that female genital cutting and male genital cutting exist on these spectrums. They have ranges. Now, it's true that in some cultures, female genital cutting may represent a sexist expression of patriarchal values. Oops, sorry, we'll just jump down here. There we go, sorry. Um, sexist expression of patriarchal values. We all know this, this is what we hear all the time. It's an attempt to contain women's sexuality within marriage and reproduction by reducing sexual pleasure. However, some women have challenged that representation and say that female genital cutting isn't barbaric. We need to consider that female genital cutting is nearly always carried out by women, many of whom believe it's a beautifying, empowering, and important rite of passage with high cultural value and little or no detriment to their sexuality. It's not a surprise then that these women vigorously defend it against our efforts to wipe it out. They believe these efforts are culturally imperialist and they're not far off the mark. So as we heard earlier this evening, the Jewish sage Maimonides and the Victorians advocated male genital cutting to prevent lust and masturbation. When we consider the history of male genital cutting, it becomes clear, to me at least, that the advocates of this practice sought to shape male bodies and control sexual desire. These motivations illustrate how male genital cutting is bound up with patriarchy. Now I've talked about the foreskin being feminized in pro-circumcision discourse and many of you are likely aware that in many cultures, male circumcision is a rite of passage into the community or into manhood. So male circumcision then is also a feminist issue because it has been and remains a method of establishing and maintaining hierarchies. Now I believe that a major tenet of feminism is equality of the sexes. It's impossible to maintain this belief though, while also promoting the idea that females are entitled to bodily integrity, but males are not. Chris has spoken about medical ethics, and I imagine that for most of you, it isn't a far-fetched idea to believe that all children, whether male, female, or intersex, should be protected from having parts of their genitals cut or removed unless there is a pressing medical indication. This concept is tied to the importance of bodily integrity and personal autonomy. So another way then in which male genital cutting is a feminist issue is its connection to rape culture. What are we teaching our children about bodily autonomy, consent, and violence against the body when we condone the violation of our sons and intersex children's bodily autonomy and consent soon after they're born? To me, the decision to condemn all forms of female genital cutting while conversely saying nothing against or even endorsing male genital cutting or intersex genital cutting is profoundly anti-feminist. 
I have some quotes, two of them, that I'd like to share with you. And you may have some reactions while you're hearing them, so I want you to just bear with me and I'm gonna explain why I'm sharing them after, okay? Author Hanny Lightfoot Klein wrote, tearing a newborn baby that a woman has carried beneath her heart for nine months from her loving and nurturing breast and inflicting a wound on its tiny, protesting and immobilized body is an unequivocal act of violence against the mother. Jewish author and feminist Miriam Pollock wrote, the biblical injunction to circumcise speaks to a man about men, but circumcision is also a women's issue, for on a subtle but very potent level, it is about the primary disempowerment of the mother. At no other time is a woman so in touch with her most elemental and powerful mammalian instincts as after a birth. Any of you who are mothers will know that. When her culture tells her that in order for this male baby to be a man, to be part of the masculine community and to bond with the male god, the men must cut her male baby on his most sensitive male organ, this mother is inevitably in conflict with her entire life-giving feminine biology. And if a woman is made to distrust her most basic instinct to protect her newborn child, what feelings can she ever trust? I'm not sharing these quotations with the intent to trivialize or take our attention away from the harm and the violence experienced by the victims of genital cutting. <clears throat> but I think that it's also important to recognize that male genital cutting is a feminist issue because of its impact on mothers. As a side note, Chris reminded me last night, research published in 2009 indicates that mothers are 12 times more likely than fathers to make the final decision on whether or not to circumcise male infants. I thought that was interesting. So all forms of genital cutting can impact the partners of those it's inflicted on, and male genital cutting is not an exception. Chris has shared information on the sexual functions of the foreskin, and therefore we can also identify how male genital cutting is a feminist issue due to the consequences it can have on our sexual relationships. I'm aware of the concerns of feminists who worry that efforts to place female and male genital cutting in the same context will weaken efforts to eradicate female genital cutting. I would respond to these concerns by saying that condemning female genital cutting, but not challenging male and intersex genital cutting, reinforces sexist attitudes about our bodies. It perpetuates the idea that male bodies are resistant to harm, or even in need of being tested by painful ordeals. That intersex bodies are abnormal and in need of alteration. It also conversely promotes that female bodies are perfect highly vulnerable and in need of protection, which propagates the notion that vulnerability is gendered. As well, I believe that eradication of female genital cutting will be significantly impeded without collaborating to address male genital, genital cutting. Our silence about male genital cutting in our own countries, paired with our loud outrage about the female genital cutting that happens in other countries, only reinforces notions of cultural superiority. Drawing attention to the overlaps of female, intersex, and male genital cutting doesn't trivialize the harm done to women. It simply highlights that others can also be harmed by genital cutting. Folks, this isn't a harm competition. It's possible to believe, as Chris and I do, that girls, boys, and intersex children all have a right to be protected from non-consensual, non-therapeutic cutting of their genitalia. So, where does that lead us? Nahid Tubia, a Sudanese physician, wrote, the unnecessary removal of a functioning body organ in the name of tradition, custom, or any other non-disease related cause should never be acceptable to the health profession. It is the moral duty 
of educated professionals to protect the health and rights of those with little or no social power to protect themselves. So the Children's Health and Human Rights Partnership was born from our awareness that as professionals in this field, we can and must do more to promote and protect children's rights to genital integrity. <coughs> now, Chris has talked about the responsibility of physicians with regard to male genital cutting. But what then is the role of nurses? I'm biased, so I'm going to be sharing with you about that. <coughs> In 1985, registered nurse Marilyn Milos was fired for providing factual, evidence-based information to parents about circumcision. She went on to found the National Organization of Circumcision Information Resource Centers and is often referred to as the mother of the intactivist movement. For those of you who don't know what an intactivist is, we can chat about it at the break. <laughs> So in 1992, more than 20 nurses at St. Vincent Hospital in Santa Fe, New Mexico, refused to assist with any male infant circumcisions. And in June of 1995, two of these nurses went on to found Nurses for the Rights of the Child. Let's just bring you to that page here. So Nurses for the Rights of the Child is an organization that's evolved into an international network of nurses and nursing students. And this group provides literature, resources, and support to nurses who refuse to assist with male infant genital cutting and wish to take conscientious objector status. 1995 was a very busy year for nurses in the movement. Here in Vancouver, non-therapeutic circumcision of all infants was condemned formally by our province's registered nurses at their annual convention. The preamble of this resolution said that in the vast majority of cases, male circumcision is a procedure without demonstrable medical benefits and is not recommended by the Canadian Pediatric Society, although a little wishy-washy. The nurses also agreed that male infant circumcision has numerous complications that are rarely communicated to parents and that most medical authorities worldwide believe that healthy newborn males have the right to remain intact. Now, what was particularly noteworthy about this resolution was that it emphasized the fact that nurses have a role to play in educating parents about the perils of circumcision and that nursing associations have a responsibility to raise awareness about this issue. You might wonder, what concrete steps were taken after this amazing groundbreaking resolution was passed to ensure that practicing nurses were informed of these responsibilities and say that nursing school curricula was updated to reflect the resolution. Unfortunately, in spite of the tremendous efforts of nurses who fought to ensure that this issue was brought to the fore, I believe there was a failure on the part of the Provincial Nursing Association and the College of Registered Nurses to appropriately follow up on the resolution. Currently, nursing students in British Columbia are not informed about their responsibility to educate and advocate for children's genital integrity, nor were practice standards ever created to guide nurses on this issue. So essentially, we're wandering around in the dark on this. In fact, aside from the Canadian Nurses Association, which specifically recognizes our right to take conscientious objector status in the case of male circumcision, most nursing organizations seem to do their absolute best to avoid the ethical aspects of the subject entirely, or simply refer to whatever the local medical association's position statement is. Why might this be? What is holding nursing as a profession back from addressing such an important ethical issue? Not all nurses, at least. <laughs> as part of relational nursing practice, nurses must reflect on their assumptions and consider whether or not they are contributing to hege hegemonies like male genital cutting, or whether they're actively attempting to change them. As Chris mentioned earlier, a study done here in Canada found that the circumcision status of physicians played a significant role in whether they were in support of male infant circumcision or not. Comparable research has not yet been done to investigate Canadian nurses' perspectives on that subject, 
But I think it's highly possible that similar conclusions might be found and that nurses' positions on the issue are influenced by either their own circumcision status or that of their partners or even their children. So it's true that a small but growing number of nurses might list themselves as conscientious objectors when it comes to assisting with male genital cutting, but I'm not convinced this is enough, especially when considering the pervasive attitudes and beliefs about male genital cutting in our society. I would encourage nurses and nursing students to remember our duty to advocate for the rights of all of our patients without discrimination, particularly our responsibility to protect the rights of vulnerable populations. In fact, registered nurse Iva Phillips wrote, and I love this, nurses must not compromise their client responsibilities for a fear of controversy. Now for the heavy stuff. Although traditional meta paradigms of nursing have not included the concept of social justice, it's my position that nurses must address social injustices as an essential component of an upstream approach to nursing. Any failure of nursing organizations and nurse educators to incorporate this concept into nursing practice and education only perpetuates our inability to be anything other than reactive to the staggering number of human rights violations and inequities that directly impact health. I believe that a feminist theory, or that feminist theory, provides a lens that helps me to identify these types of inequities and injustices, making it a natural vehicle to promote social justice as a meta-paradigm nursing concept. With that in mind, I look forward to continuing my research into this subject with the goal of providing support to nursing students and nurses and offering a nursing perspective to the broader academic discourse on the topic of male genital cutting. Look at that, we made it to the last slide. So, I'd like to conclude my presentation with a quote from author Rosemary Romberg, who sums up my hopes for how all of us might move forward in unity for the children. Much has been expounded on feminism. Men's rights are also gaining in re recognition, but the time has come to grow beyond that. In an arena with one gender pitted against the other, no battles will ever be won. Instead, we must recognize that we are all humans together on this planet. We must strive for human liberation in this, allowing wholeness and completeness for our own children's bodies and acknowledging and healing from our own wounds is but one step along the way. Thank you. And now we have time for a Q&A and I think we'll open it up to both of you guys if you've got any questions. Um, just going back to the quote that Proton, what, what, are, what organization was it that's, that sort of put that big ugly caveat at the end of their... Canadian Pediatric seats? Society. Okay. <clears throat> so, I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious that that would be akin to, you know, the American Astronomers Association saying that empirically we can see that the universe works this way, but for the last word, you know, check with your priest or your mom. Um, you know, they would, uh, they would obviously never do something like that, right? And it's in the same vein as that. So do you think, what do you think is lending itself to that? I mean, there's, certainly there's a controversy, but it's kind of idiotic to expect them to offer this sort of culturally relativistic perspective as a medical organization. I mean, it's their job to just say, well, this is, we've seen that it's bad, that's all. You don't have to consult us on you know, whether we think that religiously or culturally it's a good idea. Um, what do you think is required to, like, where, where do you think that's coming from? Why do you think it's so prevalent there? And what do you think would be required to change that? Yeah. So I think there's two factors there. So the f you cannot ignore the financial factor for sure, right? Every baby boy is born with a $400 bill wrapped around his penis, and I've heard that, right? Um, there is definitely a financial incentive for, because what, what you'll see in certain communities, most physicians, I would say the majority of physicians feel like me, where they don't think this is an ethical thing and they, they won't offer this to their patients. But there are one or two physicians who will, right? And at 30, 30 seconds, at uh, $400 a pop with thousands and thousands of patients coming in for circumcision, those physicians are making an absolute killing 
Okay, so there's definitely some financial motivation for sure. And the CPS, you know, it, it, is, it does review scientific evidence, but it's also a bit of a trade union for physicians, right? So it, it has the best interest of, of its members at stake, and some of its members are making a lot of money doing this, right? So that's the first factor, financial. But I think a more important factor, I, I do believe that there is a, a psychological compulsion among uh, certain physicians to keep perpetuating this onto children. And they, they will use every defense mechanism there is. They'll emphasize with the child, I don't like doing it, uh, but I do it because I'm good at it and it's safe for the child and the parents want it and someone has to do it, so I'm the guy, I have to do it. So you don't think that that caveat is sort of just a result of not wanting to get, draw any sort of controversy or ire from special interest groups? Or? Well, yeah, like I think, you know, by reputation, pediatricians tend to be a relatively non-confrontational group of physicians, yeah. right? So I think that's part of it as well. But, um, but you know, why do certain physicians continue to practice it? I, I, I would be interested to know of the physicians who perform circumcision, what is their circumcision status themselves? And I bet you the vast majority are in fact circumcised. I, I, I'm thinking more along the terms of sort of like for organize, medical organizations to more broadly accept a more black and white statement on it, right? So, I mean, I think that statement itself spoke to both. Yeah. The CPS, it's the Canadian Pediatric Society, so I think, you know, it would be naive of us to say that they are not themselves, you know, immune to cultural biases. When you look at the position statements from medical organizations in, you know, Royal Dutch, I'm thinking specifically, they're very cut and dry about it. They make no bones about it. There's none of this, you know, oh, well, but in the case of, you know, such and such situation and family and religion and tradition, you know, magically it's okay. They're very clear that it's an unethical procedure, that it raises human rights concerns. So I think it really depends on where the medical organizations are geographically. I, I, sorry, just one last point. I don't think that the, the pediatric societies, that the medical associations are ever going to be the solution to this particular problem, right? I think that eventually that, uh, and you know, with the internet and with with the way information spreads today, I think the next time the CPS comes out with one of their position statements, that the, the population will just kind of roll, roll their eyes and say they're, not, they're still not going to stand up and, and fight for what's right. So I mean, I think this is, this is going to be one at the level of the courts. Sooner or later, there's going to be a lawsuit, and a circumcised male is going to sue his circumciser, and he's going to win. And then the, then the associations are going to have to, the Canadian Medical Protective Association, the insurers, the, the, um, the colleges that, that um, uh, regulate medical practice in the provinces, then they're going to have to start listening, right? But I think the courts are going to uh, do this for us, because my profession's failed to address this. I mean, my profession's failed miserably to address it. <coughs> Is CPS like a trade organization? Like they're not really like medical. I mean, they're obviously a group of doctors, right? Yeah. But they're not really like a, the last word on the scientific. Like they're like concrete collaborating. It's, it's, they're not like. You know what? You're absolutely right. I mean, like you, you look at uh, best practice recommendations from these organizations. Wh which practitioners should be performing circumcisions? There's no way they're ever going to say a nurse practitioner is qualified to perform this procedure. A rabbi with absolutely no medical training at all, who has no training in sterile technique, it's fine if he does it, but there's no way this nurse practitioner is ever going to be good enough to do this procedure right. So you're absolutely right. There are trade organizations with the interests of their members, uh, first and foremost. You mentioned earlier about the, uh, the mouth uh, to genital product of rabbis, right? How prevalent is that still? It's done, it's a highly um, it's it's rare. I'm yeah. I'm just gonna put it. It's not something that happens with at every bris. It would be the orthodox. Yeah. You it's, know. It, well, you, group. It's called mezitza baba, and it's practiced by a very small orthodox group. Um, and, and this was a controversy in New York City a couple of years ago because the public health authority authority was mandating that if mezitza baba was going to be performed, that parents would sign a consent form first. But it is legal, right? Because circumcision is an unregulated procedure. So it's, it's le anyone can, I, you know, anyone, one of you can go out and perform a circumcision. It's not regulated at all, right? We don't recommend that. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to add, probably I'm the oldest person in the room, and I think that you have to um, also understand how scary it is 
for people of my generation who came right after the Second World War to ever be called um, anti-Semite. And I think that's what drives those caveats, is that um, anything you say that is um, critical of something Jewish, you immediately get branded as an anti-Semite, even if every single thing about Judaism you admire, except that one tiny bit. So um, I think that's what is constraining, and I don't think when you're in younger generations, decades after that, you actually understand how constraining that is. And for me, as an intactivist, it was a breakthrough for me when I stopped uh, being careful about upsetting Muslims or Jews about speaking out against circumcision because I came to the realization, it was actually an inner realization that it was anti-Semitic not to speak up and defend Jewish baby boys and Muslim baby boys. And when I got that piece of the puzzle, then I stopped delicately going around um, be careful about religious craziness. Because it is religious insanity from people who are incredibly bright, you, um, for the most part. Yeah. It's crazy, with, with, and they're starting to see With it. an exemplary record on human rights to go do it. I would just add to that that, um, that there is no such thing as a Jewish child. There's no such thing as a Jewish baby. There is a baby born to Jewish parents, but that baby is too young to know his own religious philosophies at that stage, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, that, that you, could, you could make the argument that circumcision violates that child's religious freedoms as well. He may not want to be Jewish when he's older. He may be an atheist. He may convert to whatever religion, right? If I could just add, I mean, Judaism is arguably the most, um, it's arguably the most modernized and changed religion in the world of all the Abrahamic religions, certainly. I mean, if you read the Torah, the Talmud, you can see that like 90% of this stuff is, is not and I think just to add to that, that's one of the things that we're really excited about is seeing the um, progression and the dialogue that's coming from within the community. I mean, the last thing that religious groups want or need is people in white coats coming and telling them that they're barbaric. Okay, I, I honestly, I don't think that that's gonna be the way that we end this. But I'm really, really um, feeling so encouraged when I see things like bris shalom, the gentle welcoming ceremony, being promoted and um, talked about openly. You know, they're, they're having discussions about this. It's a, a ritual welcoming ceremony for boys and for girls, so it's um, promoting equality, which is lovely, um, and it doesn't involve any genital cutting. And this is something that's becoming, we're starting to see the shifts, and it's just, it's such a positive change. So I'm really excited about that. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I, um, my husband, who is circumcised, when we found out we were having a son uh, over my dead body, am I going to let my son experience that? Um, and he has never mentioned it since. So it's very mm -hmm. interesting to me that there's a real um, place in, in my husband is a lovely, strong, gentle man that he can't, he doesn't want to talk about it, he doesn't want to know the details, he doesn't want to know where I am tonight, mm -hmm. does not want to know, can't talk about it. And it's a real interesting place in our relationship where even though this is something that he feels keenly, um, he doesn't want to be told that he's a victim. He doesn't want to be told about what he's lost. He doesn't want to know more about what was taken away from him. And I, I noticed this same thing happened when I took um, first year anatomy and physiology uh, at the university level while I was on maternity leave, because why not? I have nothing else to do. Um, and the, doc the, the teachers used a textbook written by an American. And there was nothing on the foreskin. Nothing on the foreskin. You have a class of 40 odd bright young people who are planning a career <coughs> in the medical field who their very first experience of medical learning and knowledge did not include anything about normal human and male anatomy. And I brought it up to say, why are we using this textbook? Oh, well, it's 
is the best one that's available. Well, I'm like, well, why don't you get a British one? My, in my son's cohort, I'm going to say that less than 20% of boys that I know of are circumcised now. And that means that there's a whole generation that's growing up that's going to be treating young people who are intact, young male intact people, and they have no idea what they're doing because they don't understand the anatomy. Mm-hmm. So, including including intact physicians, I, I'll add to that. Yeah, ludicrous to me. Yeah. So, so, but in that classroom, when I brought it up, there was a real discomfort with, in any way, having the young men in the class feel like something had been taken from them. They, there was, we were not allowed in that classroom to make a man who was circumcised uncomfortable with his anatomy to the extent to the detriment of, of future babies and children. And the, the place where my feminism includes being an activist is that how is it that we're okay telling an entire continent of black women that they're victims, but we cannot tell a classroom of white young men that maybe they're victims too. And, and I'm really curious as to the thoughts of, of you guys as to like how to bring that up, how, how to balance that, because I'm not even doing it in my most intimate relationship, of, of supporting and encouraging and loving and accepting the male body that is circumcised while also educating that, that it's not okay mm-hmm. and that we have to move forward from that. These are really big questions and I wish that I had the answers but this is all so new. We're, we're moving into this territory and we have no idea what we're doing. You know, psychologists and therapists don't even take this seriously. You know, men who want to seek help, you know, who actually are at that stage in their journey, you know, describe situations where, you know, I was told that, you know, I'm crazy, that, you know, I can't get over this and, you know, that I've even seen people online, feminists, call men man babies because they talk about their feelings. I mean, we have a lot of work to do on this issue and, you know, it's not something that's going to be solved overnight and probably not by our professions, but it's going to be the broader discourse, I think, in society where we all need to shift our attitudes big time on this. I think think one of the most important places to start, though, is to point out the uh, cyclical nature of it. I mean, it's, circumcision, in my opinion, is, is a meme, memeplex, right? A self-replicating social phenomenon. And one of the reasons why it's so effective at replicating is because of the silence. Um, because it's not considered polite to talk to your parents or your children about whether you were circumcised or whether you were not circumcised, right? It's just not polite t- conversation at the dinner table. Um, it's not polite conversation with any members of your family. And that's one of the reasons why it's so good at replicating, right? So I think that um, the first thing to point out, though, is that at least we're talking about it, right? At least we're pointing it out. And we're saying we're doing this thing over and over, and we, we, we keep this cycle of harm going specifically because we're too afraid to talk about it. And some people are going to be uh, some people are going to be hurt from that conversation. There's going to be parents who've done this to their children are going to break down and cry. I wish I had this information. The medical system failed me. They didn't give me this information when I needed it the most when I was postpartum after 14 hours of labor, nobody told me any of this, right? So there's going to be, um, you, but you can't not deliver the message for fear of offending certain people because then we're not doing any service at all for the future generations at all. It's a tough conversation, but um, sometimes the tough conversations are necessary, right? But, but it's less about offending, it's more about hurting. It is about hurting. I got, trust me, I emphasize that the, the, the Jewish mother who's had to sit there and fight every instinct in her body to allow her son to go and have this done, and then she has to have cake and coffee afterwards in the reception. I mean, this is an enormously hard thing for her to go through, and it, it, it's important for us to emphasize with what, you know, how conflicted um, these, these people are that have been hurt by this, right? Um, but I, I still think that the message has to be delivered. <laughs> And I think, too, just to one last little piece on this, just in my years of, of doing this and seeing and talking with people over the years and seeing their personal journeys, especially women, and it's sometimes it does take years for their partners to come to it, and they come to it on their own. You know, they 
maybe a book is left lying out, you know, something like that, and and then there's a discussion, or there's you know looking into restoration, things like that. So. I think we need to honor our partners and whatever their journey is and however that looks for them, we need to just be there for them and support them however we can, you know? Sorry, during your um, studying into nursing, did you find the male foreskin as part of the anatomy within the books that you studied from as well? Because I have a similar story to what you were talking about where a very close friend to mine, relative actually, um, is married to a nurse. Mm -hmm. And when they had a baby boy, it initially was a question, should this happen, that was brought up. He was circumcised, he didn't want it to happen to his son. Mm -hmm. But she overrode him and had it done without his consent. Um, and the entirety of her argument was, when I was studying it, it was never in the textbooks, it's not something that should be there, it's something that we should not have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm wondering, did you encounter it in the textual sense? So I was really fortunate that my textbooks, you know, the anatomy figures that are contained in them, they all showed a normal intact penis and the foreskin was there. It wasn't really discussed with much high regard. Um, generally, the only comment was, this is the part of the penis that is removed in the circumcision. That's about it. Mm -hmm. But I have, in working with nurses from, you know, particularly the United States, um, absolutely, there's textbooks right now that are in nursing school, and they don't know anything about the foreskin because it's simply not there in the picture. It's absent. Yeah. So, yeah, you're right. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit older than Kira, but um, I was at U of T the year that Grant's Anatomy, which is the uh, sort of the anatomical authority in, in Canadian medical schools, and it's edited at U of T. Uh, Ann Osborne, the editor of Grant's Anatomy uh, at U of T, the year I was there in 1992 or 1993 was the first year they actually changed the appearance of the penis from circumcised. They put it they they put it back to an intact penis actually, and that was that was an issue at the time. I remember that, and there was an explanation in the book explaining that as well. Uh, there was still no training in our medical school about function form, uh, just how to cut it off, right? But uh, the anatomy textbook at least showed. A little dashed line. <laughs> Cut here. <laughs> Cut here, yeah. But, uh, but you know, in the lab, uh, uh, the vast majority of our cadavers were, I mean, we did penile dissections, of course, the vast majority of the cadavers were circumcised, right? I just wanted to give an example from my own practice. Um, I this is a feminist and a woman's issue. Because um, at first, you might think, as you mentioned, it might be just a male issue. But um, I knew a woman who had been born with an abnormally large clitoris, right? And the first thing the doctor said to the mother was, do you want me to remove this offensive organ? That was a quote, do you want me to remove this offensive organ? Fortunately, the mother said, no, this is the way God made her, and she can decide for herself, right? Now, but if her mother had not said that, there would have been an amputation before. Right now, this woman grew up to have three children, was very orgasmic, perfectly normally functional, except she had a large clitoris. So what? Right? And she, she had a daughter that had a large clitoris as well. So here you have 25 years later, and the doctor said exactly the same thing. Do you want me to amputate this offensive organ? So there was no progress in 25 years. Right? So this is why it's a woman's issue as well, because if you're not born in a way that conforms to the doctor's presuppositions of what a girl should look like, you're threatened with surgery, right? unless your mother is strong enough to say no. That's why that this is an issue that affects all genders equally, to allow personal choice. Like, I'm not anti-circumcision. If someone has an adult besides, they want to be circumcised, well, fine. I, uh, like everyone else here, I, I think there's, people should have a choice. This is the issue here, choice. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you so much for sharing that. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yeah, okay. Uh, the CBS was really late putting out their statement. It was announced to be just around the corner about two years before it actually came out. And I heard rumors that there was significant uh, turmoil behind the scenes there. And I'm wondering, based on what you heard, what was going on while they were putting together that statement? Well, there was a lot of letters from our organization. <laughs> <laughs> Quite a few, and they're online, you can read exactly. Yeah. There's no death threats, it's all just scientific. Uh, but uh, um, yeah, there was quite a bit of conflict. But I, I don't, uh, you know, this conspiracy of secrecy, unless you're part of that inner circle in the CPS, it's very hard to find out exactly what was going on there. 
um, I can imagine there was some pretty heated debates. Like, you take the AAP, their position statement was made by seven people, seven physicians. That's the entire circumcision task force, right? Seven people get to decide an issue like this. I'm told not, none of whom were intact. None of whom were intact or married to intact partners. And one of them <laughs> circumcised his own son on the dining room table, right? Um, but yeah, so the you know, seven group of people, there's there's quite an opportunity for some bias, right? But yeah. I, I haven't, I don't know exactly what happened, but uh, uh, they, because the the newspapers said uh, new circumcision policy to be released next week. Two years later, it comes yeah. out wishy-washy. Uh, it takes a long time to be that wishy-washy. Let me tell you, to be that vague yeah. and non-committal. But obviously, they, they announced it. They did the pre-publicity, <laughs> and then it didn't come. Yeah. So something happened. Something was definitely changing. Yeah. Thank you for writing those letters. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, yeah, OK, we have to wrap it up. But I just want to say thank you guys so much for um, coming and speaking. And thank for the wonderful turnout. Thank you guys so much for mm -hmm. attending. And please give them a round of applause. Thank you.